Well, good afternoon, everyone. You might be used to my voice by now, but I am Kevin Klein. You just heard from Kira Provenzano of the NGA's member services team. I'd like to welcome you all to afternoon session, day two of the President's Council Week, and thank you all for attending this afternoon session, the COVID-19 pandemic and golf course challenges and opportunities. President's Council is traditionally one of the most important days on the MGA's calendar, and given the challenges this year has brought to us all, we're pleased to be able to offer a week full of informative virtual sessions. The astounding turnout underscores the great commitment we all have to keeping our clubs healthy and the support we get from the leadership of our member clubs. We hope everyone will be able to take something away from today's session and the remaining presentations this week that will help at your own clubs. The MJ works hard to help our member clubs navigate the challenges and opportunities that the game is facing. One of the ways we do that is by collecting and sharing information, acting as a resource and clearinghouse, and by conducting educational programs like today's. With this in mind, I think we have a very full and interesting program remaining for you this week. I'd like to stress that this is intended to be an interactive week. The whole intention of the President's Council is to bring you MGA member club leaders together to share and exchange ideas and discuss what we feel are important issues facing clubs in the game of golf. This afternoon's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. So again, we encourage your active participation and involvement. The MGA is committed to supporting our member clubs during this difficult time for everyone, and we aim to over deliver and be the best we can possibly be. I hope meetings like today help in that goal. We want to thank all of our supporting sponsors for this week, and we hope you will seek them out when they can be of help to you and your members. Please let Kira and I know if we can provide additional info on any of our partners listed here. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Adam Miller, Director of USGA Green Section Education. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented numerous challenges to maintaining golf courses. Labor challenges, increased play and car traffic, touch points and safety concerns, Adam is here to discuss the most common observations from how the pandemic has impacted golf courses and the best strategies to deal with the new challenges in addition to discussing positive trends that have been developed in response to the pandemic. The golf course, as we know, is the club's finest asset. And as we all know as well, COVID-19 impacted golf course maintenance in many obvious ways. Golf courses were closed as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. And as courses began to reopen, Golf course superintendents were forced to adjust management practices to compensate for the new regulations, while many were operating at reduced staffing levels. Adam is here to discuss the realities golf courses are now faced with and the importance of wisely allocating resources to avoid creating long-term problems. For many, there was a need to reduce maintenance costs since income is being severely impacted. There are many ways to save dollars, and it's critical to evaluate the short and long-term effects of all cost-cutting measures. Unfortunately, as many of you know, the Green Chairman Seminar was canceled early in the spring due to, due to COVID-19, but we've listened to your feedback and they're delighted that Adam is with us today to discuss all of these items concerning the golf course. We've been lucky to have Adam present at our Green Chairman Seminar for a number of years and they're delighted that he could join us for this President's Council crossover session. Adam attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Horticulture with special emphasis in turf grass management. He holds a Master of Science degree in Agronomy from Purdue University and has conducted research on several areas of turf grass management. And just yesterday was in the Met area visiting one of our member clubs for a consultation of their bunker work. Adam was an agronomist in the Northeast region of the section before moving to his role as Director of Education. It's now my pleasure to introduce Adam Miller. Adam. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kevin. Um, great to be here. Great to um, you know talk to so many folks that I've, I've most likely uh, met and talked to uh, in the past. Um, got my camera on, so you uh, you're kind of invited a little bit into my into my basement here. So um, I'm going to try to keep this as sort of light and informative uh, as we can. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, I was really a, a full-time agronomist in the Northeast region before moving into my role as director of green section education. So I, I still um, am out in the field conducting course consulting service visits, um, but uh, adding to my role as, uh, as director of education where um, I work with the team uh, at the USGA to produce um, the green section record magazine, which hopefully many of you subscribe to. 
Uh, so the, the presentation today is really a combination of uh, field observations that I've made, field observations that our agronomists in the Northeast have made, um, and, uh, and, and really it's been a, a collection of data and information that our entire team across the U.S. Uh, has made. So there's some, we'll start sort of big picture across the U.S. and then focus in on really sort of the unique challenges and opportunities uh, in the metropolitan area. So hopefully we have time for uh, questions afterwards. Um, I know sometimes it's a little bit of a, uh, a tricky, you know, tr tr tricky with technology to ask questions in this sort of setting, but um, certainly open to, uh, to any question, questions you guys may have. So our agenda today, we're going to just really start with sort of the state of the industry um, and then look at some of the specific challenges uh, and opportunities that the pandemic has, has created. And it's definitely one where um, courses, I think, are, are going to be stronger in the long run because of the challenges that they've faced uh, this, this entire season. So we dive into, you know, nationally what's been happening with golf. Uh, obviously, the Northeast was uh, severely affected uh, by uh, the, the shutdowns um, that Kevin had mentioned. Um, and, and that was something that it was a little unique in that more, more states were shut down uh, in the Northeast than in other parts of the country. Um, folks in the Southern half in the US, for instance, didn't, didn't get shut down at all. Um, so nationally, um, we had an average of, uh, you know, rounds were down uh, 42% uh, in April. And, and a lot of that was because of so many courses were closed. Um, and then if we look sort of once every, everything was back open, we saw a resurgence in rounds of golf played uh, across the board with May being an uptick of 6.2%, June up 13, 14%, July up almost 20%, and August was 20%. Uh, again, these are, these are national numbers, um, and it's something that's, that's pretty impressive to see. In the Northeast region, I, I've had a lot of conversations with courses that have got record rounds. Um, you know, they're up 25, 30% in some cases with their, their total number of rounds. So it's, it's really pretty interesting. And, and this is something that a lot of folks predicted that, hey, golf, you know, it's sort of conducive to social distancing and, and doing all the things that the health organizations have been recommending. Um, and it's, you know, with different events, you know, being shut down, schools being closed, um, not as much recreation for families. Uh, golf, really, it, it was a perfect opportunity to be, you know, on the forefront of, hey, let's give folks an opportunity to play golf, get outside, um, you know, just get out of the house and still feel like they're, they're safe and, and um, you know, being responsible. Uh, in terms of specific club memberships, you know, there was a lot of concern early on as to what's going to happen with people's financial security and jobs and things like that. And obviously that has a trickle down into our, our discretionary income and our discretionary funds. Um, but we've seen in a lot of cases, there's been you know, big increases in, in membership opportunities. Lots of folks have um, reported that they've, they've gained you know, 20, 30 new members um, just this season. So that's, that's really exciting because obviously with new members, um, we see, you know, influx uh, in capital, um, and that's something that, you know, helps the course bottom line. Um, the question that, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is it's great to have new members and, and to, you know, obviously boost the bottom line a little bit, um, but we need to make sure that any new members that courses have gotten, we need to make sure that these folks are, are going to, you know, really stick around long term. Um, so, again, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, the, the revenue side of things and the maintenance side of things, maintenance budget side of things has been pretty inconsistent. Um, you know, we've had, like I said, increase of rounds, um, but revenue and maintenance budgets are, are hurting in some cases, especially where facilities have relied heavily on weddings um, and outings that just, you know, were canceled. So that, that money is gone. Um, and it's some have, uh, you know, recouped some of that uh, through the increased play. Others, they've pushed their outings into, you know, this time of year into the fall. Um, but those folks that were really reliant on, on those types of, um, you know, facil or those those types of outings and, and weddings definitely were hurt um, pretty significantly. 
Uh, the same would be true for any any course that's sort of a resort type course. Um, you know, so those types where folks really are they're traveling to get to the course um, definitely saw some some challenges. So I've heard a number of of courses that have talked about 15, 30 percent revenue loss, even though rounds are are up. So that's that's obviously a concern, um, but there's an opportunity there that okay, let's focus on where our revenue um, is coming from and, and minimize some of our expenses in, in some areas that maybe aren't as crucial uh, to the golf to the golf course. And the question that a lot are still asking are, well, when are these weddings going to come back? Um, you know, are outings going to return? Um, what what do we do there at our facility? So it's it's kind of all over the board. Um, again, not every course focuses on weddings or has a lot of outings, but um, that's definitely one that um, has people's attention. So with that, I wanted to move into some specific challenges uh, that we've we've seen firsthand and heard from a lot of superintendents uh, in the Northeast region in particular. Some of these are, are really relevant um, across the whole, whole US. Um, but before we touch on the challenges, I think it's important, important to really think about sort of a snapshot of what we're hearing right now um, at a lot of member clubs, especially in the Met area. Um, we've got full tee sheets, we've got record rounds. Um, because of those two combinations, you know, golf courses, they, they always sort of get a little tired towards the end of the season, um, but they're exceptionally tired and kind of beat down uh, this year. We're hearing from a lot of superintendents, a lot of uh, course officials, you know, golfers have expressed some frustration, uh, whether it was, you know, some challenges with playing conditions, more weeds. Um, we're hearing lots of comments about, hey, there's just, it seems like the attention to detail on the course isn't what it used to be. Um, and, and because of that, there's a lot of folks that, you know, if their revenue wasn't significantly impacted by, by weddings uh, or outings, you know, they're, they're looking at how can we, you know, get better? How can we, you know, actually invest more into the maintenance operation of the golf course? So it's interesting that these are some common themes that we're hearing right now um compared to really the at the outset of when the pandemic first hit in march so i wanted to sort of plant the seed here that this is a lot of what we're hearing right now um, and then we'll, we'll sort of rewind the clock a little bit and go back to sort of early april so in early april well late late march early april uh, that's really a, an important time for golf course maintenance operations in the northeast uh, so much activity happens on the course in March and April to sort of get the go the course ready for the peak golf season. Um, so there's a lot of activity. Uh, that's when most people's staffing levels are are really starting to ramp up uh, from their their winter staff levels to to their full season staff levels. Um, obviously, that's when the pandemic hit, and with so many unknowns, still people weren't sure when courses would open per, per play, if at all, this season. Uh, so the name of the game from most course officials, general managers, presidents, owners, whatever it might be, the comment was generally, hey, if we don't have to spend money on certain areas, let's not spend money there because we just don't know what revenue is going to look like. We don't know what golf's going to look like over the next few months. And so superintendents were then in, in, a, in a tough situation because they a lot of times were left with a skeleton crew. It was maybe just the management staff and a few, you know, full-time foreman type positions to maintain the entire golf course. Um, a lot of folks didn't bring, you know, a lot of their staff back up until the time once courses were really open for play. Um, and so from a superintendent's perspective, you know, a lot of the comments were, okay, we're going to scale back. We're going to do our part. We're going to do as, as minimal maintenance as possible and really only focus on the key areas. Um, so we're not gonna, you know, do the, the you know, some of the same, uh, you know, blowing of clippings or, or divot filling, or, you know, we're not gonna think about string trimming certain areas. We're just gonna try to get the golf course, you know, maintained to what we can do with the small staff that we have and try to get timely applications out for crabgrass and certain diseases that are, are really weather dependent. Uh, so there was just a, a general consensus that hey we we can only do so much and let's not bring on any added expenses if we can scale back so there was less focus on details 
less focus on hand watering um, requirements for you know tees, fairways, um, again less string string trimming throughout the golf course. That was that was really the name of the game throughout April and May uh, and early May. And you know for the most part, everyone was on board. Golfers really weren't out on courses just yet um, in, in most areas. So it, it was sort of a nice break for the golf course. Um, but again, as we we saw soon as golf courses were open they were packed and it was really hard to do a whole heck of any a whole heck of anything um, from a, a maintenance standpoint so again these types of things were common uh, you know just the detail work that courses they either didn't have the staff um, or they didn't have the time because the tee sheet was full to get to some of these common things that they would otherwise do uh, in terms of unique challenges just sort of managing the staff was was really difficult and there was a lot of different ways to, to do this to try to minimize the spread of the, the virus again there was still still is so many unknowns about um, how the virus spreads uh, but the focus really was hey let's do as much as we can to keep our distance reduce touch points on the golf course um, golf courses that had fewer staff uh, they implemented split shifts there was increased efforts to, to keep everything clean, staggered start times for their staffs. Uh, there was a number of courses that instead of their, their normal you know, meeting inside the, the, the maintenance facility before jobs were assigned, they were meeting outside, keeping the distance. And then some of the obvious things to try to minimize spread that, that we all saw, risers in the cups, um, you know, removal of bunker rakes, removal of course accessories like ball washers, all these types of things were just a little unique challenge that started to really add up and it, it made it hard for golf course superintendents to, to present the same type of product, the same type of playing conditions, the same type of golf experience that their golfers were, were used to, um, you know, for, for the past few years. Um, and, and early in the season, everyone was just thrilled to be out to play golf there was a lot of acceptance of you know hey it's fine there's a little bit of you know weeds here or there or parts of the course aren't maintained at the same level we get it we're just happy to be you know out playing um, as we really dived into the labor challenges that that continued really throughout the entire season um, there's been a lot of courses that just whether they didn't have the labor um, they intentionally scaled the labor back. Um, they had a full tee sheet, so they couldn't get out and maintain the course the way it was. Um, all these things sort of added up to just fewer labor hours used to maintain the course this year compared to last year. Um, and that's what, what this uh, survey sort of looks at. Uh, this was a survey that we asked uh, superintendents uh, and course officials, you know, just describe your total labor hours used year to date this year compared to last year. Um, and more than half of the respondents uh, have, have used um, anywhere between less than 20 and 40% fewer labor hours this year compared to last year. So obviously there's going to be an impact. We can only sort of camouflage, um, you know, where these, these labor hours are, aren't, being, aren't being used on the course so much. Um, so that was a big impact that just sort of continued to accumulate as the season went on when you just didn't have the staff um, to, to maintain the course at the same level. And one of the big challenges that that a lot of courses faced was what staff did they lose? Um, or what staff, you know, said, hey, I'm not I'm not working. I'm gonna go back to um, where where I you know have a full-time residence um, if there's um, you know that type of scenario. Um, H2B staff, for instance. If you lost key staff, I mean it, it was it was a much more impactful um, situation at your course versus you, you have, you know, some high school kids or whatever um, that, that you that you couldn't get this year and you had last year. Um, there's a, a skill set, obviously, with any industry. And if you lose key staff members, management staff, foremen, people with lots of experience, and they're replaced with newly hired staff, you're just not going to have the same level of, of uh, quality work. There's, there's just no no getting around that one. And that was a very common theme at a lot of golf courses uh, that, that our agronomists and myself included have, have visited and talked to. That If you lose a couple of the, the, the right people, it, it makes a huge impact. 
the superintendent and the assistant superintendent, they are management staff. Uh, and this, this year they had to do any number of daily tasks in a lot of cases, in addition to then trying to, to supervise the staff and to scout the golf course for challenges and for disease and, and drought issues, things like that. So really made it tough on, on the superintendents this year to try to manage their staff and, and especially when they lost some, some key contributors. Another part of that is, you know, midway through the season when things were, you know, everyone was kind of realizing, hey, we're, we're actually doing pretty well right now um, financially or, you know, with, with rounds. Um, let's try to boost our staff up a little bit. Um, the unemployment benefits that so many folks received because of furloughs or whatever it might be, um, that actually had an impact on maintenance staffs because, you know, if we, you know, if the course wasn't going to be paying someone more than what they were getting from unemployment, the motivation really wasn't there in a lot of cases. So uh, while it was, you know, obviously needed for some some folks to have unemployment, um, that didn't always help us from a maintenance perspective on golf courses. So it all, it, it ends up with, if you've got less maintenance on the golf course, combined with more play on the golf course, that, that's a recipe for problems, obviously, or just a recipe for not being able to meet um, year in and year out expectations uh, for most memberships. Probably one of the, the most common things that we've we've heard from superintendents and, and seen it firsthand, uh, the impact of single carter, single rider cart policies, um, increased pull cart use. I mean, these these definitely the amount of increased traffic from carts and, and pull carts has taken a toll on just about every golf course. And it's Again, it's fantastic. We were still able to play golf. Um, we were still able to enjoy it. Um, we saw increased revenue, in a lot of cases from cart usage, but it's it took its toll on on golf courses, especially a lot of the golf courses in the Met area that are are they're built in the you know age of classic architecture. They weren't designed for 20,000 rounds. They weren't designed for the amount of cart traffic. Uh, and pull cart traffic that that we saw this year. So the grass took took you know took the brunt of it, and thankfully we've had a pretty good fall to get things to recover. Um, but you know that was probably something that you didn't notice in years past, just more wear and tear on the golf course because of because of the carts. Wet areas, um, holes that were you know tight, you know have lots of bunkering, things like that. Um, that kind of funnel traffic, they were more vulnerable than than more wide open areas. Um, ropes, stakes, signage. These were used pretty differently at different facilities, uh, especially early on. Um, the, the mindset was let's not restrain anybody going anywhere as long as they're not going on the greens. Let's take the ropes and stakes down so we spread traffic as much as possible. Other courses increased the amount of ropes and stakes and signage just to be able to try to funnel traffic. Um, and, and rotate where all those carts were going. The challenge with ropes and stakes is they have to be moved. And when you were dealing with fewer staff to maintain the course, you know, there's an efficiency that ropes and stakes really slow down your mowing operations. So it was kind of a double-edged sword. Do we increase ropes, but then reduce our efficiency of, of mowing or, or what, what's, the, what's the best situation there? It was really a course by course decision. Um, so again, lots of just sort of tired, worn down areas, adjacent to landing areas around greens. Um, because of the increased traffic, we saw a lot of increase in weed populations, especially that thrive in more compacted, um, compacted areas, parts of rough that just sort of lost their density. Um, and I, I mentioned again, golf carts, they, they did help some, some courses from a revenue perspective. Um, but the, there's a hidden cost to, to carts that we need to sort of keep in the back of our minds that, okay, we brought in more revenue, but we needed to do a lot more overseeding or, or aeration or maybe even sodding around cart paths here or there because there was just so much traffic. So it's important to keep that in mind. Again, in the big picture, it was a thrill that, that we could have so many you know, players out there enjoying our courses, um, but the golf carts took a toll. And long term, it might be something where, hey, we need, you know, to put some sort of a cap on on the number of golf carts that are allowed on the course each day, or maybe it's investing in some more cart paths, things like that. That's what that's what a lot of courses are thinking about. 
Some others uh, wear on, on tees, again, more play, more divots, more foot traffic. Um, it's actually made some courses kind of accelerate their plans to renovate tees, enlarge tees, um, make sure they've got enough tees for the right players. Um, a lot of the new members that courses have had are more of the beginner type members. And so that's a good opportunity to let's get some more forward tees out for these folks that are new to the course, perhaps new to golf and make sure we have a good golf experience for them. Um, so again, it's hard to build practice tees large enough. We'll talk about that in a second, but the regular tees on the course, good rule of thumb, about hundred square feet of usable teeing area for every thousand rounds of golf played um, for par threes and the first and 10th tee or others where irons are used. You, you want to double that number. So, you know, long term, are these rounds going to stay, you know, as high as what we experienced this year? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it might be one that, you know, your tees just just aren't big enough to accommodate all the extra play. Other things that um, we saw as a challenge from in response to the pandemic, you know, taking bunker rakes off the golf course really improved maintenance efficiency um, and it helped with pace of play, certainly. Uh, but we saw a lot of courses um, where golfers were walking down high sides and just, you know, kind of just playing golf and, okay, I was in a bunker and I'm going to move on. Um, so the, the damage is particularly concerning when there is a slope, you know, because that you can see that footprint in the image there. I mean, that's that's creating a really poor golf experience for the person behind you. So there are ways to to you know, try to manage that with, with smoothing, you know, with your foot, but the best situation was just to, you know, kind of like what we always recommend entering from the low side, not only does it reduce the potential for causing problems with the grass, but you're going to probably have a little bit less of a hard time to smooth out that area with your foot afterwards. Practice areas, I mentioned this a little bit before, but increased play, increased use of practice facilities, um, especially on smaller practice greens. So some courses went to starting to change the cups on their practice green daily, uh, which is pretty labor intensive. Um, others actually went to use the uh, cupless targets. You know, they just have the, the spike on the end um, and they could rotate those really, really easily. So it's just lots and lots of foot traffic and so many uh, courses, you know, their practice greens are, were, were built again for, for a different time, um, not necessarily to accommodate 20 to 25,000 rounds of golf annually. Uh, the same is, is definitely true for uh, the, the driving range, practice range tees. Are, are, there's so many of them in the med area that it's great you have them, um, but a lot of them are just undersized. So um, they, they received more wear and tear this year. Uh, they always get a, a lot of use and, and there's been comments that you can't build them big enough. Um, I tend to agree with that. But one thing that, that helped obviously was the more uh, more and more golfers that are using the linear divot pattern on practice tees as opposed to a scattered pattern or the worst would be the the concentrated divots, the big patches. Um, so, but again, these are somewhat common themes uh, that, that we do see in, in a lot of years. It was just elevated a little bit, a little bit this year. Uh, and then finally, sort of dealing with with the unknowns that that Mother Nature uh, would would bring, and and obviously we can't control the weather. Um, that's always the joke, you know. We we keep complaining about about the weather, but no one ever does anything. Um, the weather was very conducive to golf in the Northeast. Um, really dry in May and June, um, made for some fantastic playing conditions. Uh, finally, we got some firm and fast. Uh, out there the past two years really didn't allow us to, to produce a lot of firm conditions because it was just rainy years. Um, but irrigation is always a challenge. The, the drier it is, the longer it is, irrigation systems are a supplement to, to rainfall. They're not a replacement. And so the drier courses got, the more, um, you know, brown and, and sort of burnt out they started to get on the edges where the irrigation system just didn't have the coverage. Once we got into July and August, it was July and August. It was hot. It was humid. We had some heavy rains at different periods. The combination of hot, humid, and rain is really a perfect recipe for uh, disease on golf courses. So thankfully, most courses, I think, made it out pretty well without having any severe disease issues. Um, but 
it's challenging when the tea sheet's full and the, the conditions are right for devastating diseases and you've got to get out there and, and treat preventatively so those diseases don't happen. Uh, so I know there was a number of uh, superintendents that I've talked to that it was just really hard to make these timely applications uh, because the golf course was so busy. Um, so combined with that, lots and lots of weed issues. Um, and, and a big part of that, when it's that hot, when it's that humid, it's hard to use a herbicide on, on any of the, the golf course turf, but especially anything with, with tees and fairways. Um, so one way that a lot of superintendents will manage around that is they'll try to treat for weeds, you know, spot spray weeds, sort of first thing, coolest part of the day. Uh, well, with fewer staff, you know, that stat, the staff that you did have was probably focused more on, you know, general course prep, getting greens mode, getting tees mode, getting fairways mode. And we didn't have the time to spray, spot spray some weeds that, that broke through until, you know, noon or, or even later. And at that point, when it's so hot, you're in a situation where do I spray the weed and potentially hurt the grass that I, that I really want to keep? Um, or do I just let that weed stay there for a little bit because not many people notice it. Everyone would notice if I sprayed and killed, you know, some of the desirable grass. So that was a situation that a lot of courses were in, a lot of superintendents were in. Um, and it, it just sort of added to the, to the challenges brought on by, um, by the pandemic. So I wanna move into uh, the opportunities that we've, we've definitely learned from, from COVID-19 and, and challenges always present opportunities. I'm, I'm definitely, definitely an optimistic person. Um, and I do think a lot of courses are just gonna get you know, better and, and, and stronger and more efficient as a result of some of the issues that we saw. So first things um, first, you know, the pandemic has really reminded us that people are coming for the golf course, number one. Having the other amenities, um, you know, tennis and the, the, the restaurant and, you know, if there's a pool, that kind of stuff, those are, are value added parts of your facility. Um, but it's when those were shut down and the golf course was still, um, you know, was open and, and seeing record rounds. I mean, and it reminds us that's really the asset. Let's make sure that we focus on the primary asset long term. Um, so thinking about, you know, managing some of those different functions of the facility, um, you know, a, a little bit, you know, with, with, with a little bit of potential change in the future of, okay, well, what's is, how important really is, you know, evening dining or, or whatever it might be. Um, again, they're important parts of a facility, uh, but we just had to change the way everything was, was operated this year. And it's given people an, a, a good understanding of, okay, you know, some, some folks might just, just want to play golf and, and that's their priority. So can we scale back, you know, different parts of, of our other functions? Um, another thing that, you know, there's been a lot of opportunities to find efficiencies within how we maintain the course within how we operate the whole facility. Um, it was kind of that scenario of it's, it just didn't seem like there was a whole lot of extra efficiencies out there at, at a lot of courses where they were already, you know, skimping and, and bare bones kind of, you know, maintenance because of the, the pandemic, but they, they found another opportunity. Um, the more of those efficiencies you find, the more you should capitalize on them and think about long term. Th this is what we should we should keep doing at, at our course. Um, and again, big thing I think long range planning is is focusing on the golf experience. Uh, not all the members that 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 course has got right now are going to stay there and stay in the golf ex in the golf industry um, forever. Um, golf is hard. Golf is expensive. It takes a lot of time. Um, so it's just the more we can make sure that we're giving a good golf experience to those folks to remind them, hey, this is why you joined. This is why you should stick around. Focusing on the new members is, is definitely something that I think is, is important. Okay, so kind of rapid fire into some opportunities. Um, we saw a lot of courses that used to um, walk mow their greens exclusively. Um, some of the best golf courses in the world that have you know, healthy, healthy budgets. Um, they just didn't have the staff in the spring that they normally would have. And they started to rely primarily on triplex greens mowers. And 
there's been a lot of efficiencies saved as a result of that because if it's a newer triplex mower, it, it can offer the exact same quality of cut that a walk mower can produce. Um, that is a big part of it. If it's an older mower, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but um, the common complaint from a lot of golfers is, well, I don't like the wide stripes um, that are created by the, the triplex mower. So some courses, uh, this image here is actually piping rock. They'll mow their um, greens with a triplex mower in kind of a half and half pattern. Others will mow it all in one direction and just rotate it you know, every, every time they mow. Um, so there are some unique challenges with using triplex mowers, especially on, you know, greens that have a lot of bunkering tight contours around um, where you have to be careful with turns. Um, and especially the cleanup pass around the green needs to be maintained, you know, very carefully, often with a walk mower there um, to avoid some extra abrasion. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's, this is a trend that is is hopefully here to stay because, it's what you used to have to, you know, require five staffers, you know, to, to walk all the greens you can now do in the same time with, with just two people um, in a lot of cases. So it's really, really important uh, to think about this long term. But again, if you don't have the right equipment to support it, it needs to be, you know, a modern triplex mower that's, that's you know, been well maintained um, to be able to support this. But really a neat change that I think is, is here to stay. Um, sort of along the same lines with, with mowing is just sort of trying to maximize efficiency, and we've known this for a while. Uh, the half and half mowing pattern for fairways is, is faster, um, results in labor savings and fuel savings um, compared to, you know, a striping pattern. Um, there's, there's no impact on golf ball Y with either one of those patterns. Um, there's no impact. Um, this is actually research that, that we've done uh, in the Northeast on bounce and roll. Um, hitting a ball into the grain side of, uh, into the dark side of a half and half pattern does not um, change how far the ball rolls out. Uh, so lots of efficiencies, little, little challenge here or there with the half and half pattern to make sure you don't have too much wear and tear at the, at the edge between the, where the approach starts and where the fairway starts. Uh, but that, that can be managed by, by rotating that line. Um, and you have wear and tear on the rough if you do a striping pattern. So to me, that's you know you're managing those types of situations you know either way, um, but again another opportunity to improve your your maintenance efficiency and save time and really not impact playing conditions. Uh, another one, and this is probably one that this group has heard of already, uh, but the question is always brought up: you know, do we really need an intermediate rough um, at our golf course? Um, by not having an intermediate rough, um, obviously there's fuel savings, there's labor savings. Um, in many cases, it's specific equipment that you need just for that one area of the course. Um, it also, if you don't have one, I, I would argue it improves definition. Um, and in, in the situation where if you've got irrigation coverage, if you've got the right grass species, you could take that intermediate rough and actually convert it to fairway. So you have a wider fairway landing area. Um, it's, not, it's not always easy to, to do that. Certainly not as easy as I just said. Uh, but it's an option. So lots of folks are considering removing this. Plenty have done it already, but this is an example of sort of the lack of definition. Like where, where does the fairway start and where does the rough end? Um, it actually is right where that golf ball is. Uh, the, the spot all the way to the right was, was just a, where the, the intermediate rough just kind of scalped a little bit into the primary rough. So the aesthetics of, of being able to sort of really see the definition of the fairway, that's important to some. It's not as, as important to others. Um, I know lots and lots of golfers love playing off of the intermediate rough, um, but it's, it's a tricky spot on the course to manage because the grasses that are there are often either below their normal height of cut or above their normal height of cut. If you've got bent grass um, in an in intermediate cut, it doesn't perform well. Uh, at that height. Same thing if you've got some bluegrass um, in that area. It doesn't always perform well um, if it used to be rough. So it's it's a tricky spot on the course and it just doesn't come into play that often. In my mind, it's more of an aesthetic uh, issue than, than anything else. But again, so here's a situation where a course doesn't have an intermediate rough and it's a, it's a much better definition, much more cleaner edge of, of that fairway. So again, 
it's not as important to some as others. Now, I know many of you are thinking, well, we can't do this. We need to have an intermediate rough at our course. Um, this was some data that actually a superintendent from New Jersey uh, collected a few years ago. Um, he did a, a survey of, I think, the top 200 ranked golf courses um, throughout, throughout the world and just asked him, do you have you know, a step cut or intermediate rough uh, at your course? And you can see uh, the list. Uh, there's a lot of you know, really, really well-respected, well-known courses uh, that don't have an intermediate rough. And some of the others like Oakmont, uh, Pebble Beach, uh, Wingfoot, um, you know, they've got narrow fairways. We've had US Opens there. That's been part of the reason to keep the intermediate rough at, at some of these places. Um, so I, I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, can you maintain the intermediate rough? Do you have the resources to do it? Um, do you have the rough heights that really sort of warrant an inter intermediate rough? Um, in, in my mind, you need rough heights typically above two and a half inches um, to, to really warrant an intermediate rough. Uh, so uh, it's just not one that's needed, uh, and it's, it's an opportunity to, to save some, some efficiency. And like I said earlier, it, it's kind of no man's land when it comes to maintaining it. Um, a lot of times they get treated a little bit like fairway at times, a little bit like rough at times, and, and they can really suffer. So um, it's frustrating when you see this type of situation and like, okay, well, why is the intermediate rough dead and the fairway is alive? The fairways cut at a lower height. It just, there's just, like I said, it's kind of no man's land. So it's a tricky spot to maintain. It's costly to maintain. And, and I would say it really doesn't need to be there. Now, all that being said, I, I realize why some courses, it, it's just a, it's a non-starter. Um, but it's one to think about, you know, in this time of trying to maximize efficiency and, and sort of focus every, you know, really, really look at where every dollar is being spent. Other opportunities, allowing natural areas to, to sort of be natural. Um, if you call them natural areas, if you call them fescue areas, whatever it might be, uh, a perfect opportunity to really just sort of let these areas, let these areas be. As long as everyone's on the same page that they will be natural. Um, again, you can call them fescue areas, but a lot of courses, there's no fescue whatsoever in them. They are just a hodgepodge of different weeds and, um, if you want to get them to be, you know, wispy and play really well and, and not have to ever search for a golf ball for more than, you know, a minute, then you're going to be spending more money on them. Um, so if you allow them to truly be natural, you're going to save on herbicides, you're going to save on labor, you're only going to be mowing these areas, you know, once or twice a year typically, but this is kind of, you know, going to be what they look like. Um, here's another example. If they get hit with irrigation, they're going to be thick, they're going to be, you know, full with weeds that's just sort of where we are in the northeast if you don't have sandy soils and you know a dense stand of, of fine fescue um you know they're probably not going to play that way right it's just that they're going to be natural so it's always that expectations versus reality um it, it's, it's they're not easy areas and they can become an eyesore um, but if you want them to truly be you know, fescue areas that are good, that play well, that's more money. Uh, that's probably more money than the primary rough um, that you got, that you have in your golf course. So just keep that in mind. One thing we've done uh, with a number of courses in the Northeast and, and I think probably close to about a hundred or so uh, nationally um, has been uh, our GPS service that has helped courses really identify where players go and more importantly, where they don't go. Uh, and that allows you a little bit more, you can, you can make more informed data-driven decisions on introducing potentially natural rough areas or, or native areas. So um, this was Mendham, New Jersey, uh, Mendham Golf and Tennis. Um, this is uh, GPS tracks of, I believe this was uh, female walkers uh, playing the course. And, and you can see lots of areas where they don't go on the golf course. Well, now we start to introduce the, the male walkers playing and you know like most places more male players walking more rounds from male players than, than female players uh, but you know you start to see okay they're, they're going a little bit further offline here or there um, and then you introduce the the male players in golf carts and lots and lots of traffic all over the golf course but 
we actually worked pretty closely with them and uh, they had a number of native areas already, um, but we were able to identify close to four acres of, of additional area where they don't get much play and they could reduce their maintenance in those areas if they wanted to. They didn't have to, um, but they were interested in, in this. And um, part of it was also sort of confirming, hey, we've got some native areas and we hear that they get a lot of play. Um, do they really get a lot of play? This is using you know, data to, to sort of demonstrate how much play they actually get. Um, because with, with, with most people's games, myself included, there isn't any part of the golf course that couldn't be in play at some point, but it's just a matter of how often some of these areas become in play. Um, and using data, you could really pinpoint, hey, there's, there's not many people that go here. Do we need to spend money on pre-emergent herbicides here? Do we need to fertilize this area? Um, you know, certainly you probably don't need to water it. Um, so lots of ways to, to be able to identify how to manage your golf course. So uh, this is a fairly new service uh, that we have. Um, if you want any inf more information, we can certainly provide that. But um, it's, it's one that, we, we, like we said, we're, we're liking to use data to make more decisions. Um, and it's it just, especially when it comes to fescue areas or native areas, they can be pretty controversial. So having some more ways to make informed decisions with these is always, always helpful. Okay, other opportunities, bunker rakes. This is a, a unique question. A lot of courses are, are asking, do we really need bunker rakes? Uh, I would certainly say we don't need as many, um, and most superintendents would probably agree with that. Uh, the, the common comment that I've heard is, well, you know, we, we weren't getting full compliance on bunker raking from our golfers to begin with, so I'm not sure we really need them out there. Um, and then the comment, this is a, a famous quote from C.B. McDonald, you know, he's seen a number of traps and bunkers that afforded better lies and easier strokes than the fairway. This, of course, is ridiculous. Um, we have gotten certainly to the point where our bunkers are, are extremely well manicured. Um, we'll never get consistency no matter what, what we do, it's just not possible. Um, but this is an opportunity to sort of take a look at our bunkers and say, do we need to spend that much money raking them and maintaining them on a daily basis? Do we need those, those rakes out there? Can we just attach them to a golf cart? What, what are our options here? So every course is different. Um, some have not put rakes back out. Others have put some rakes back out. Um, but I think ultimately it's a good opportunity to say, we don't need to spend probably as much money on maintaining bunkers, which are by definition a hazard um, as intensively. So a couple of ways that superintendents are, are scaling back their bunker maintenance, um, re reducing their raking, um, just sort of machine raking um, the bunker floor using the Aussie method, which is what is shown here, where you really just smooth the edges um, and don't disturb those as much as possible. Um, and then rake, rake the floor. The idea is you save on labor. Um, it does seem to improve playability by allowing the ball to hit the bank and roll more down into the flat. Um, so a little bit fewer buried lies, uh, but there are some challenges too. By not ever really disturbing that, that edge, um, you can see some increased algae potentially. Um, so they may need to get stirred up you know, every once in a while. So, but this is a common one, aside from just let's not rake them as often. Other things, um, ball washers and accessories. Again, probably one that you've you've heard of, but um, a good opportunity here when we took benches and ball washers off the golf course to reduce touch points. Um, you know, did we get a lot of complaints? I haven't heard many personally about you know the lack of ball washers. Certainly, I, I see how some you know couple here or there might might be important for for golfers, um, but not not much complaints there, uh, not much about benches, things like that. So um, they, they, they take time to maintain, they take time to service, that all adds up. Uh, so it's, it's just a question of, do you really need those things um, out there on every tee? Um, some courses, they're just, they're not gonna put them out at all. Uh, there's been other courses that have been ahead of this and have not had these types of accessories out for, for many years. So um, this might be your opportunity to say, hey, we had ball washers everywhere. Let's only put a handful out or let's not put any of them out. We can just, you know, use a towel and, and get it wet before we play and, you know, just clean, clean things that way. So again, yeah, just another opportunity. Uh, the same is true with, with gardens um, on golf courses. 
with reduced staff, uh, we just didn't have the, the bodies to really maintain these areas to a high level. Um, and I would say they don't really impact the golf experience that much. Um, certainly not ones that are throughout the whole golf course. It was just, these are hard to maintain. They're costly to maintain in a normal year, uh, let alone in, in a year like, like what we've had. Uh, another smaller one, uh, I, I think fewer courses are doing sort of painting of the hole. Uh, it's really surprising that it's been a common practice at, at a lot of courses. It, it's, it really started purely for TV purposes so the camera could pick up on the whole location uh, a little bit better. And now it's, it's become you know, almost standard practice at, at a lot of facilities. Um, it's, it's not overly costly when it comes to paint and equipment you know, every year, um, but it does take time. It adds time to your course setup procedures and that adds up over you know days, weeks, months, years. Um, so it's just one where it's a nice thing to have, but it's certainly not crucial. Um, so yeah, another efficiency opportunity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, focusing on the golf experience to me is the biggest opportunity that, that we have when it comes to new members um, at, at our facilities. And most of the folks that I've talked to, their new members are more of the beginner golfer category. Um, more family golf, whatever that might be, um, where in a lot of cases, the swing speed might not be as fast. They may not be, you know, a super skilled golfer, just, just beginners that, okay, let's think about how the course is playing for them. Um, before we jump into that, I think a huge opportunity and one that hopefully is going to stick around a, a while is, is um, thinking about tee time intervals. This is one where uh, we've done a lot of research on tee times, tee time intervals, and how that impacts the pace of your round and the flow of your round. And the narrower the tee time interval, certainly you can get more players on the golf course in a shorter time window. You know, that morning time window is often important, um, but that leads to more backups, um, longer pace of play, and really a, a disjointed flow throughout your round. Um, we've all had it where you could play a five hour round but not wait. And that's a much better experience than pay, playing like a four and a half hour round, but you're waiting on every single shot. So because of COVID, we, we stretch tee time intervals at a lot of places, 10, 11 uh, minutes or more, and those are still in play. Um, it's better pace of play, better flow through the golf course. Um, really something that I think um, some more golfers should, should look at, more, more golf courses should look into. So um, as opposed to just sort of, if any of you are familiar with the club pro guy um, on social media, he's got some tips for uh, for combating slow play that you know are are entertaining, um, but they really don't solve the problem. They're really more aimed at uh, at, at player issues and, and possible confrontations. So um, if any of you guys have have not watched that video, club pro guy tips for combating slow play, it, it's one to check out. It's it's a good good three minutes and you'll be entertained. Um, so that's exactly what he's trying to trying to do here with this picture. Um, okay, as I mentioned earlier with, with some of the new players, um, particularly ones that have uh, solar swing speeds, um, and maybe it's not just new players, it's, it's older players, whatever it might be. Um, if you've got a solar swing speed, a lot of the golf courses in our area, you know, really aren't set up very well for those those players, whether it be just they're too long, too many force carries, um, whatever it might be. Uh, so having a, a good equal golf experience where players are able to hit, you know, a good tee shot and hit a good second shot and get on the green and have a chance for par. Uh, I mean, that's something that I think we all should really think about. Um, my sense is, and, and myself included, until you're playing directly with a person who can't reach par fours in, in two, can't ever reach par fives in, in three, and sometimes can't reach par threes in regulation, um, it's hard for us to really recognize that so many of our courses are not set up um, to provide a very good golf experience for players with slower swing speeds. So um, there's an increased emphasis on building more forward tees. Uh, obviously, it's going to help with pace of play for some players um, and, and really help with, um, with an overall golf experience. They don't need to be huge um you know sometimes they can be built within you know an existing fairway uh, I, I do see value in having them be a separate t um, that's not just a 
a placard, you know, sort of within the fairway. Um, they, they need to kind of feel like it's it's a real tee, uh, but it's definitely an opportunity that so many of the courses uh, in our area have, <clears throat> and the ones that are capitalizing on it are are, are definitely going to have an advantage when it comes to you know getting a golf course that is right for sort of you know every type of player that that they can have an enjoyable golf experience because it's I've, I've played enough golf with my wife who's a beginner um if i had to hit driver three wood into every par four i i just wouldn't play as much golf it just seems like it'd be it'd be too hard and, and wouldn't ever be sort of very rewarding to me um so the more we can focus on on those folks the, the better um, this is a, a forward t calculator uh screenshot that we have um, and it's pretty straightforward. We use handicap and swing speed data from from uh, the golfers in in our gene database, um, and and really gives us information that we can customize to every course based on your your yardage of your forwardmost tees. And so, just a real quick snapshot where you see the red X um, on both the the left and the right image. Um, the red X means that the player most likely, even when hitting you know, one of their best drives and best second shots can't reach the green. Um, so the uh, profile on the left is for um, an average female player with a swing speed of about 60. And the, the profile on the right is for the average male and has a swing speed between 80 and 90 miles an hour. Um, and so you can see, I mean, there's just, it's not the same golf experience at all. Uh, the average female with a swing speed of 60 miles an hour is reaching only the par three tees, or par three greens in regulation. And, you know, there's opportunities there. I'm not saying every hole has to be dramatically modified, but there's certainly opportunities to improve the golf experience for players with slower swing speeds. So really think about how you're setting up your course and maintaining your course right now. Um, now is the time to, you know, have a, a more golfer friendly um, setup in my opinion. Um, you know, difficult rough that requires a lot of ball searches, fast green speeds, and tricky hole locations. Um, some golfers might really like that, uh, but a lot of beginner players, you know, that's that's only a pain point. Um, that's only going to lead to perhaps more frustration and, and and potentially sort of force them to say, "Do I really enjoy myself when I'm out here, or what else could I do with this this chunk of time and and this uh, discretionary, you know." discretionary income that I have here. So again, I don't think it's a time to necessarily purely focus on making the course more difficult unless the new members that you have are are all like better players. Then then maybe it's a different scenario, but um, we haven't really seen that so far. So thinking ahead, what, what does the future look like? I think if any of us really had a, a strong sense of what that looked like, we would be um, you know really ahead of the curve. Um, certainly, the, the pandemic has has been more impactful, lasted a lot longer than I ever imagined. Um, so I think there's still more unknowns than knowns at this point. Um, but we do have a number of courses that they're they're looking to try to focus more on the course, focus more on on building you know a successful track record of investing in their golf course more than they had in the past because they're seeing rounds of golf go up. Um, and potentially their revenue is up if they weren't hurt too significantly from lost uh, weddings and outings. What I would say is if you're looking to invest more into the golf course, whether it be more labor, uh, potential renovations, whatever that might be, um, I'd be really mindful of how the tee sheet is structured. Um, it's not easy to just throw more labor out on the golf course and expect that, okay, now we're going to take the course to the next level because we've got five more seasonal staffers. Um, the, the folks need to have the right time to maintain the golf course. And that's where with lost outings, a lot of courses had member play just going off the first tier, the 10th tee, like it was a normal day. Instead of if you had a Monday outing, um, a lot of courses would have, you know, between sunrise to, to noon when that outing started to really dedicate towards course maintenance that was free of disruptions, free of having to work around golfers. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, maybe it is you need to have, you know, a maintenance day or a half day each week that's dedicated to maintenance or perhaps a maintenance gap uh, where you block tee times off for like an hour and a half um, on a one day a week or so. 
it, it takes time to maintain the goal, the course and like I said just sinking more resources into adding staff um, doesn't always pay off if they don't have the right time to get all the work done or to get the work done efficiently um, it also I think it's important to look at the course long term and say if we want to see steady improvements um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight um, you might see a few things improve you know next year or the year after but it, it's a commitment it's it's a long-term approach uh, nothing really happens really fast in, in golf course agronomy except for problems. So investing more in the course is is great, but we need to make sure that we have time to maintain the course, and, and we also need to have a realistic have, have a realistic view of that. Hey, this this is going to take some time before we can really see market improvements. Um, it's not something that it's it's instant. It's not a light switch. Um, so when it comes to potential renovations, I, I would say spend wisely on, on things that you know are going to have a positive impact on the golf experience. New tees, potentially, you know, renovating bunkers, um, maybe even cart paths. That might be the, you know, the thing that's most needed out there. If the cart paths are, are really bumpy and, and banged up and you're suddenly seeing more wear and tear, uh, we might need more of that. So things to think about, but again, um, there's so many unknowns that I would, I would be Cautiously optimistic with how you're spending uh, from a capital perspective, um, but it's it's not one where I think we know enough yet about the future landscape and how long some of these new golfers are really going to stick around. So with that, uh, I, I've wrapped up everything I had prepared. Um, if you'd want some more information, feel free to subscribe to the USGA Green Section record. Uh, you can just text the word Green Section all in caps to um, that number. Um, you can reach out to me directly through my email or uh, or Twitter, um, or reach out to um, just our department if there's a general question, green section at usg.org, or even reach out to us on, on social media. So uh, with that, hopefully we've got time for some questions. Um, I know I went just, just a touch long, but um, I can always, always want the opportunity to, to ask questions. Adam, thanks so much for uh, taking some time out today to join us. Um, while a couple of questions come in, just want to remind everybody that we're going to unmute you. So please feel free to ask a question of Adam, and uh, hopefully we'll have some answers for you. Did have a question, Adam, that came in um, regarding green speeds expectations um, during COVID. And with lower staffing led to less rolling, mowing frequency. Uh, have mm -hmm. you encountered this problem during the golf season and any solutions? This difficult time is very hard to answer members with heavy thoughts with limited resources. Yeah, I, I have had a few conversations around green speed and, and it is that it, it's, there's not a dial on the mower that just says, okay, we're gonna get green speeds to 11 today. Um, it, it's usually a combination of maintenance practices um, it's it's certainly mowing frequency, rolling frequency, even top dressing plays a role. So if you know the course was too too busy to get a lot of top dressing out, it became harder to get green speeds because the turf canopy um, was more prone to kind of swelling up and, and becoming a little bit sticky during human conditions. Uh, so the the that's a good opportunity then to think about can we introduce Traplex mowers? and maybe do some double cuts. It's a lot easier to do that than with than walk mowers. Um, so I, I've had a few of those conversations, but not not too many. I think um, you know the weather dictates so much of of what we can do with green speeds as well. And it was it was a tough weather year. Uh, so that in itself made it hard to to produce the the sort of the green speeds that a lot of players really want to see. Thanks, and uh, Chris, hopefully that helps answer your question. And obviously you can reach out to us or Adam with anything offline um, for more specific answer. Uh, Adam, just a question for me. Obviously, you know, the superintendents on the line are familiar that kind of the 2021 season is already getting started. Um, fall aerations and things get going in August. Anything for the the member or the, uh, the green chair or the general manager, um, just to give them a, a quick snapshot of, of already what, what's going on planning the golf course for next year maintenance wise? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's budget season right now, I think for, for just about everybody, I'm sure plenty have had, you know, their first sort of round of, of budgets submitted. Um, the, the question that I really have again is, 
so the, some recent conversations particularly okay let the, the the courses you're interested in trying to get get better get a little bit more resources on, on the course um the unknown still with with outings and with the t-sheets and rounds for next year um you know a, a fifty thousand dollar budget increase you know is not a, an insignificant value um but if the rounds are still there it's going to be that much harder to to sort of capitalize on that those, those increased in funds so i think that's the hardest part is knowing what what play is going to be like and, and how we can still maintain the course to try to improve things with such busy you know busy t-sheets thanks any questions from the group see some of you have... adam um my question is uh is there anything that we can do as golf course operators to help attract more female golfers that's a great question yeah i i think certainly trying to provide you know that a golf experience that's a, a little bit more enjoyable for for you know, most females based on the data we have have slower swing speeds uh, so trying to make it as welcoming as possible to say hey we've got you know the right yardage for for you potentially um, i think that would be good um, just sort of my observations, you know, it's golf is a tough, a tough sport to, to sort of be a beginner at regardless of your male, female. Um, so the more you can have clinics and, and group folks that are, you know, playing the sort of the same skill set, they're the same level um, and they're not put in a situation where they've got, you know, a bunch of really good talented golfers right behind them. Um, you know, on the tee sheet, that, that always makes it a little intimidating. So the more we can do to kind of group those folks together and, and create a good welcoming environment for them, I think the better. Um, and definitely from a over tees or just trying to create a, 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 an equitable golf experience, one that isn't, you know, really, really challenging for, for players with slower swing speeds, I think would help. But yeah, it's it's a great question and there's there's not a whole lot of like, solid do x and you'll get y um with with that one so it's it's tough thank you yeah i think to, to adam's point also with clinics and those types of things you know from an mga perspective um, we had a clinic last week we have another one this afternoon uh sponsored by lexus where we're bringing women to golf courses and getting instruction from the professionals um, and a little networking event after that. So we'll continue to conduct those types of events to get more women out learning how to play the game, to get them more comfortable. Uh, and Kira has been spearheading a women's advisory council that had a successful event last week at St. Andrews Golf Club, where there were about 50 women from the men area who came together to play nine holes of golf and get instruction. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that the MGA is trying to do to bring more women to the game. And, and those are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, the club leaders need to just continue to communicate with their own members. Um, you know, if, if the male is on a handicap roster and they're, they have a spouse, how come the spouse is not on the handicap roster? Find ways to introduce them to the game, events, et cetera. So there'll be some more ideas in a couple of sessions over uh, tomorrow. Um, but those are certain things that you can reach out to the MGA that we're happy to help with. Any uh, final thoughts or questions from the group? You know, Adam, one other question I had was just, you know, it, it was a crazy year and in March, no one really knew what was going on and, and all the, the skeleton crews and, and maintenance staffs reduced and budgets and, you know, just the key things, communication, right? That the, the maintenance staff and the club leadership, they're all on the same page with a number of issues, but just kind of getting through the season and into next year, just, you know, staff exhaustion or just making sure that the superintendent and general manager, they're all on the same page. Uh, any thoughts on that or, or from your travels and feedback? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I mean, it's one of the, the things that I think we need to really hone in on is is we, we, we're very reactionary to what's going on. We, we sort of have to be right now more so than ever. Um, but I think the, the key here is to communicate, okay, here's the plan right now. We're, we're going to have, you know, fewer staff or, or whatever. Here's what the expectations are. Here's what's likely to happen. I mean, su superintendents, everyone predicted 
all the things that were going to happen this year when it comes to, hey, we're not going to have as many staff. We're going to have more weed issues. We're going to have, you know, more of our focus on the middle and the edges of the golf course are going to look a little bit, a little bit rougher than usual. Um, we, we can, we can pretty safely predict that. Um, just knowing you don't have the, the same bodies, the golf course is going to look and play differently. Um, the key, I think, is communicating and, and really remembering, hey, this is what we all talked about. Here's why the decisions were made at this point. Um, and, and let's stay committed to that. And, and if the, the outlook changes, then, okay, great. But what, what we're seeing right now is at different points, like there's a lot of questioning, well, how, how come this is like this now? And, you know, that decision, you know, it, it really, it was cemented back in, in April. Um, you know, here's why we had more leads this, this year. We didn't have the same staff to dedicate. So the more we can communicate, the more we can sort of stay committed to here's why certain things were done, um, the, the better we're going to be long term. Well, great. Is there someone else trying to get in or otherwise we will wrap up? Well, thanks again to everybody for participating today and joining us. Just remember, we have two more important sessions tomorrow, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. noon. So hopefully you can take some time out and join us. We will uh, send a recording of today's session and the PowerPoint presentation to all of you later on today. But Adam, thank you again for taking time out of your day. I uh, hope all is well. Everybody stay safe. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. And please let us know if we can be of help to you or your members. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Yep, take care.